I hope so. You are the host now. So, hi everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Parnes and I'm a, profess a professor in pervasive and mobile computing, um, computer science for uh, simplicity. Uh, and I work at Lulu University of Technology and uh, also I'm part and founder of something called the Architect Learning Lab, which is a strategic effort on um, learning using digital tools. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, Walkabout, a net-based interactive multi-use 3D environment for enhanced and engaging learning. And if you want to take a peek at my presentation during my presentation, you can uh, jump to the link here at the bottom. Uh, that's my blog. So partners.com slash blog, and you'll find my presentation there. This, I'll share this link later as well. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the background um, a bit and history, why we're doing this, uh, like this project at all. I'm going to talk about something called MSTAR Ameritech. I'm going to talk about an application called Dialogica, uh, which is sort of um, step one towards Walkabout, and then talk about Walkabout itself, and then conclude about with about a, a bit about sort of the current status. And actually, before that, I'm going to talk about future and, and future um, uh, implementation parts as well. And then I'll do a demo of both Dialogica and uh, walkabout, and I'll have a uh, uh, and, and an open discussion uh, as well at, uh, after that on how we can use this. So the background. So why are we working on uh, on this at all? Well, uh, first of all, um, video conferencing have by some been said that sort of that it's it's boring. It's just sort of video windows and people are not really that engaged. Uh, in the pictures at the bottom here, at the left, that's sort of an image I grabbed from the Zoom website where they have some kind of team meeting. This is supposed to be Zoom employees uh, and they're, they're all very happy and everybody's sharing video. But in reality, at least when I do teaching, I, I present to about 50, 40, 50 students and I'm the only one sending video. And instead I get a lot of empty black squares with just name tags in them. So it's a rather sort of anonymous education situation um, there. And with the assumption that uh, learning should be fun and fun means higher engagement, um, we, sort of want to look at which tools can we use to create uh, and encourage engagement and sort of also increase the wanting to learn more. Then, and the final thing sort of on background is that I've been working on online meeting tools since around 1994, when I was part of creating called Center for Distance Spanning Technology, it was a research center here in, in Lulio, uh, where I worked on something called uh, the MSTAR or the MSTAR system. And MSTAR was a distributed application that we created way before um, Messenger, Skype, Google Hangouts, Google Meet these days, and all uh, Zoom and all the other tools. Back then, it was just a sort of, um, if you want to do, do video conferencing, you had to go to dedicated rooms, etc. And the vision here was came from a gentleman called Dick Fevström. He's no longer with us. But he sort of invented the idea of us doing this on, on the desktop. And we were doing quite a lot of new novel things back then. At the bottom left is, for instance, screenshots of, one, sort of the world's first multi-user uh, video conferencing um, application running on uh, mobile. So that's around invented in 1999 or so, 98. Top left is sort of another version, a mobile version of, of the sort of the MSTAR Maratech system and, uh, and a few other screenshots here. So in, 19, no, in 1997, uh, people started wanting to buy our prototypes and we had a lot of visitors, et cetera. And to 
as the university wasn't really into selling software, we created a, call, a company called Meritech, which has existed until 2007 when um, Google came and bought all the technology and the sort of M star Meritech technology merged into to Google and later became Google Hangouts, which is today Google Meet uh, there. So, so that's sort of the background story around this. I also got my PhD in this area in 1999 um, on the underlying technologies for doing sort of large scale video conferencing. And with large scale, like I mentioned that we, we targeted upwards four or 500 simultaneous users in the same room. And we actually had in a test with one, one vendor over 400 active video streams in the same session. And, and it worked on, on the computers back in sort of early 2000. So uh, the work, um, our, another sort of background tidbit here is that all of the work that we do uh, are doing in this area is cross-disciplinary. So it's a cross-disciplinary collaboration between computer science, myself, my area, and the research field of education. And here in the session, we have Ilva Backman and also Victor Gardelli, who's worked on this uh, project, will join us uh, a bit later. He yeah, had teaching right now. So, so they, they are from the education field. And then myself and Robin Rubindal have been working on um, uh, on sort of the technology and implementation of this. And we come from a computer, uh, uh, computer science or formerly pervasive and mobile computing is our subject. And as I already uh, mentioned initially, this is also part of something called Arctic Learning Lab, which is the university's effort in, um, in learning or research around learning and learning from sort of birth to death. So we're looking at sort of the whole span of, of learning there, um, we're learning with digital tools, I should say also. So you can read more about Arctic on that, uh, that link. So Dialogica. So Dialogica was born um, when Ulva and Victor came to me uh, around 2019 or even 2018 perhaps, um, where they proposed us that we would develop an application to help people with disabilities uh, express themselves. So um, uh, people with aphasia, that is uh, that you have um, trouble expressing yourself, you have basically had some, some kind of trauma to your brain, uh, can be from an accident or you had a, uh, a blood cloth or something that sort of broke your brain, say, uh, so to speak. And, and these people have trouble expressing themselves and they can be that they can't speak uh, really well, they are might, not, um, might be physically impaired, uh, etc. So, so we wanted to create an application to help them express themselves. And that is the application of Dialogica. And here you see just two screenshots in there. You have a sort of a fixed 3D world. It's a 3D world, but you can't move around in it. You just stand, stand there and it can be up to seven or more participants in there um, um, doing different kind of animations. They can chat, etc. But also you can use this to have quick chat, um, more organized chat conversation around something called the philosophical um, conversation tree, where you build up a tree um, of the conversation where you can then sort of give arguments, you can question and, and sort of get a structure to the conversation. And this is really important to help people that have um, sort of the, where their short term memory is broken or they have or they can't really express themselves verbally to like say, oh, the thing Agneta said uh, five minutes ago. I mean, if, you, if you only can say yes, no, and uh, then that's a really hard thing to express. So using this tool, they can express themselves better. So that's a sort of a parallel thing to walk about that we're talking about here today. So in Dialogica, um, it's a, uh, a multi-user uh, application. Um, so you can either use this sort of in a distributed way, this built in a voice chat, just as in, in we're doing now in Zoom, or um, you can use it in the same room uh, as a complement when you actually see uh, each other. 
Uh, in this, you can choose the kind of avatar you want to have. You can choose different kind of animations. You can choose worlds. Um, you have chat messages, so both sort of predefined messages, and you can create your own. There's a text to speech, and you can do this with the different voices. And we also have implemented real time translation. So, for instance, I can chat in Swedish while uh, the iPad on the other side speaks this out in French or Polish or uh, Persian or uh, Hebrew or whatever language uh, you want it to be spoken in. In there, as I said, we have voice chat, and this is what I call sort of static 3D worlds. We, we cannot move around in them, so it's just like animated backgrounds. It's full 3D worlds, but, but you can't uh, move around, and the target here was iPads uh, primarily. And we're currently doing testing with this with people with handicaps uh, that, uh, that want to sort of express themselves so in, in different tests. So as, uh, we also have real-time translation of both text and the voice. And here's just an example of four different clients uh, running in four different languages. So here we have the bottom right is English, then we have French, Polish, and Hebrew in, in this example. And this is then translated in real time. And those are not predefined messages, but this actually goes to Google Translate, fetches translations, and, and then presents them uh, just as good as Google Translate can, can do it, obviously. So it, it might not be perfect, but I think it's a huge step forward to being to cope with situations where we have, for instance, students or participants that are not fluent in Swedish or English or some other uh, sort of common denominator. So, so we can actually mix languages within the same uh, session. So moving on to walkabout. So uh, walkabout is then the sort of the, the extension of Dialogica. Uh, in Dialogica, we, as I said, it's a static 3D world, but we uh, quite quickly saw a need for sort of moving and breaking out from that sort of the staticness and going more into to, um, a sort of a, a open 3D uh, world. So, um, so here it's a it's a uh, what I call a multi user a multi user experimental virtual environment for learning, and I'll explain different parts of it now. So walk about uh, an open world for education and other activities. Um, the idea here is once again just as in Dialogica is that using avatars, uh, students, teachers, users can express themselves in various ways without having to share a sort of physical image of themselves. Um, so instead they express themselves using avatars. They can use this for communication. So uh, the walk around, wave, have different kind of animations, but also using voice chat. So it has a sort of a distributed voice chat built in. You can use this for presentations, so you can then launch web screens in there. And I also want to mention that I think this is a good way of talking about inclusion as well. So people that don't want to show themselves or uh, that we uh, or that we get a, an environment where people are sort of on same level. There's nobody that sort of have different skin color or, okay, of course, everybody can have different skin colors on their avatars, but those skin colors doesn't have to match the real world. Gender um, doesn't have to match. So you can have, uh, if I'm a, ma a male user, I can have a female avatar or I can have an avatar that's sort of gender neutral. And uh, especially the sort of gender neutrality is something that has come up during testing that, that we need more of those uh, sort of avatars that are not gender specific. But using this kind of tool, then we can more easily invite new uh, uh, users in this environment. So as I said, multi-user. Um, so we can today have about 25 to 50 participants per room. Um, we haven't really tested with more than, than, than 50 uh, today, but the, the system scales well. So most likely we can have more, just that we haven't done the testing for that. 
we can simultaneously have many different rooms so so we can create new rooms and when when you launch walkabout you get a list of of different rooms that you can join and here in in this case here you see five different rooms and you can see how many participants are in there and this in this particular case you have a screenshot in in swedish uh, because when i took the screenshot we didn't we hadn't done um, uh, internationalization of the user interface yet. It's there right now, but it wasn't back then. We have many different avatars. Um, I'll show more of these later on, but uh, we have more than 150 and we have several hundred more that sort of are being uh, are available to us uh, from this sort of this graphical low poly style, uh, but they're not integrated in the environment yet. And also we're looking at extensions where we basically will have hundreds of thousands different variants of avatars when we start to modify skin color, hair, things you put on your head, uh, gloves, attachments, etc. And then when you mix that, you get a lot of different uh, sort of combinations of possible avatars. We also have a number of 3D worlds uh, in there. Here are just six, and uh, there are no more. So at, at the left side, we have two what I call space worlds. We have this sort of top left is the space explorer world. And then at the bottom, bottom left, we have the space scavenger world. And we have more sort of these sort of space worlds um, available as well. We have a, a Western world, we have an adventure world, a city world, a, a more fantasy kingdom world, and, and many more. I'll show you that, that later on. Something that's that's uh, quite and sort of natural when moving in a 3D world is that you have 3D positional audio, and that means that the audio changes with the distance, sort of, or the audio level changes with the distance. So the further away you are from a speaker, the the less you will hear or the lower the volume will be, just as in reality. And, and me and Agneta, we were doing a test session here uh, earlier today, and I had forgotten about this, and we were trying to suddenly. I thought that sort of the audio broke. I couldn't hear uh, Agneta anymore. And then I realized basically that I had moved too far away from her, so I couldn't really hear her uh, on it uh, anymore. So we'll have to look about sort of on the sort of user interface to signify and, and show that. But this also means that we can have natural breakout rooms just as we would in a physical environment. So instead of jumping into separate rooms where we can't see each other, instead we could say, okay, um, everybody that I want to talk about uh, natural audio, uh, go with Agneta and, and, she, and she with her avatar, they walk, uh, walk away and, and those that want to talk with her, they also walk with Agneta to some, some distant uh, place and then they can talk with at, without the other groups hearing them. But we can see each other uh, just as in real life if we were standing like in an open field or something. And, and by that we get sort of a more closer feeling. And then the, also you, you get this feeling that for instance, if you, have, you are a teacher or you have a teacher in the room and they move between the different groups, you actually can see the teacher coming towards the group. And it's not sort of they're sort of suddenly off, whoa, there's the teacher in my breakout room. Uh, and I get sort of get nervous. Well, did I, did I say something bad or something? But you sort of, you get a prepared that, that something, somebody's extra is going to be able to hear you uh, in a moment. So a big part of doing education as always is, is having some kind of, some way of showing uh, uh, web content. And, and here we have sort of web screens for external content. Um, and the idea here is that these web screens aren't sort of predefined, uh, but rather you, you launch them when needed. So you can have several of them in the same session. So here you, you can see two examples, one in the Japanese samurai world and one in the Western world uh, or Wild West world, um, where you uh, uh, put up these web screens and have different avatars looking, uh, looking at them. So it can be that I prepared a sort of a, a one part of my lecture in one place. And then when I want to sort of switch context, I can then move over to a second web screen where I've prepared or I'm opening up a, a different set of, of slides, uh, for instance, just to sort of signify a context switch um, between uh, different parts of my uh, lecture or activity. 
Of course, um, people get lost. Um, these 3D worlds, some of them are quite big, so it's quite easy to sort of, uh, you, you can't find your way back, etc. Then you can easily uh, fetch users to you, or I as a teacher, the host, can fetch everybody to me, sort of just take all the students, uh, have them pop to me, and then the system sort of will move them to me, basically uh, move them to a point above me, and then we'll, they sort of will fall down and basically rain down uh, around me and then by physics position themselves uh, in, in this world. And also I can jump to different characters, which might be good if I have different groups in there. I, said, I, I as a teacher can then move between different points uh, quite easily. Animations, I've mentioned this several times in here. Uh, animations is quite a key thing to have animations where you can express yourself. So here is a static image of showing animations. Um, so you see, for instance, in the back there, there's Agneta on the floor doing bicycle curls. So she's training hard. We have this skier guy is leaning back, uh, flipping his legs back and forth. And then we have, uh, or actually Agneta is standing up there. And now I see Agneta's name on her. Uh, she's standing there typing on an invisible iPad um, there. So, so that was a bit sort of a, sort of the technical detail. I'll come back to technology in, in a moment, but sort of what kind of learning scenarios do we foresee here? Well, one um, being live lectures, um, just as we're doing right now, that I can then do a, a live lecture in there, I can flip my slides, users will then come next to the world uh, or to my web screen and see the slides or they can move back and be, sort of stand sort of signify that they're not, uh, not um, interested or signify that they are very interested by moving forward. And they also can say, oh, if something's boring, then they can sort of start looking around or moving or doing uh, something else uh, there. The breakout groups I've already mentioned earlier, so we can move move uh, groups of students or users to, to other places. The second scenario, that is the more the prepared student presentation, and that is that we have a 3D world and the uh, students in this world then can prepare their own setup. So they can launch their sort of web screens, they can prepare the slides, etc. And then when it's time to present, present then everybody move to that specific presentation uh, place. Then the third one is more informal interaction and spontaneous meetings, sort of the kind of sort of hangout that we just have an open world. People just are in the world, just sort of do things and can say, oh, wow, hey, cool. There uh, Agneta showed up so I can talk to her and, and do whatever. And the fourth being a sort of a, a the sort of learning questions and, and 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 or asking questions. I mean, and here the, the asking can be sort of to other students, obviously, but also to the teachers and to uh, to um, bots in there. And then I'll come back to to bots in a in a moment. Active learning is a really uh, popular thing to talk about these days. And how can we engage the students and be more active in their learning? And active learning uh, research show that, that if you are more active in your learning, you learn more. You remember more from what you've actually learned. So, um, so using Walkabout, we see that you can create a new types of uh, virtual learning environments, obviously, it's all sort of these 3D environments, uh, but you can also, uh, this is this doesn't exist yet, but something that I plan on, on thinking about and sort of implementing in the future, and that is that uh, using the sort of the, the power of being able to move people around, moving the avatars around, we can by, uh, automatically create different kinds of setups in, the, in here. So we have like predefined, say that we want to have have a whiteboard together with all the students sitting in a half circle. And then basically just the system would then move everybody into this here. And this can be do, then do sort of randomized or we have preset uh, positions and, uh, and various ways. And uh, the idea here is that the teacher should be able to define these scenarios that it, so they can use it in their own, uh, in own teaching. Very much compared to that you tell students to organize themselves in groups or move around in an auditorium or uh, in a bigger room or something. 
And then it, uh, you can add different kinds of interaction objects to that, then web screens already mentioned, uh, whiteboards and 3D objects to discuss. I can load in models to, uh, to discuss. Another important part is gamifying education. So how can we gamify um, this and, and get, uh, get students to want to learn more? So here are just four suggestions. Um, one being, um, or I think all of these are quite obvious, but, but just to mention them. So one being missions. Uh, so you get the sort of, instead of you, you get your sort of um, instructions on say a, a canvas page or a Moodle page, you would then go uh, uh, walk around in this 3D world and you would then find your missions. So you have to sort of explore the world uh, there, or it could be that uh, that everybody gets this sort of predefined. So when you join uh, the room, you get a notification, oh, I have this new mission. Uh, yeah, I have to, for instance, go and fetch the instructions somewhere, or it's just there and I have to do things and, and report back the results in Walkabout to get approved. The second part is, is points. Um, I get sort of, when I do things, I, I get uh, points for doing them. So it can be sort of when I, I successfully uh, complete a mission, I get say 10 points or 100 points. And these points can then be counted towards um, the exam and grade. And we're already doing a test or this in certain courses here at, at Lulu University of Technology. Um, where students actually get these points and then the exam becomes easier if you have sort of worked with these sort of missions and gamified uh, things. Or the points can be used towards fun stuff like gimmicks, you get new skins and toys and, and uh, things like that. You get suddenly you get access to be able to shoot fireworks or something there. And the third being that uh, also that you might want to sort of stage the functionality. So you have to do things, but when you get certain amount of points, you unlock new functionality. So in there, uh, sort of the, the application will then grow with usage. And this is quite common in many games, uh, etc. cetera. Sort of, you don't have all the abilities when you start off, but when you sort of do more and more, you get more and more uh, abilities in the game. And by that, you also learn how to use the different parts more sort of um, by, by certain levels. Then we can have the third one is challenges that we can then challenge individuals. I, for instance, I challenge Ulva to, uh, to a quiz uh, on this, uh, the subject that we're taking right now in this class. So we can then compete in, in the knowledge. And this can be done on individual levels, in pairs or groups. It can be sort of in private or in more public setting where everybody can, can see this and we can sort of have these kinds of challenges. And the final one is daily activity. And this is something that's used in, in many, le both learning games and normal games. And that is sort of these streaks. That is, okay, uh, I've been using this tool now for, um, for uh, for 72 days i don't want to lose my streak so i really i have to to join the environment on the 73rd day uh, as well um, in there uh, so so that to get them sort of motivated to enter and it can be also that if you join for five consecutive days you get a reward you perhaps you get points or you get a toy or you get a new skin or something Moving on, uh, something that we're also planning on and uh, been discussed is the sort of this learning companion. And, and this is some, a, a sort of a entity that looks different from the normal avatars um, in, in there. Uh, today, all the avatars are sort of human-like, uh, sort of bipeds standing on, on, on two legs, arms, etc. Uh, some are more aliens, some are more skeletons, but basically they have sort of a humanoid form. The learning companion on the other side is more sort of a, a something that the, the avatar or the user have with them. So it can be an animal, to be a dog, a cat, or a spider, or in this here, a penguin or a shark floating uh, next to them. And this one, this uh, is sort of a semi intelligent entity then that can. Um, and can give responses, they can uh, give encouragement, give feedback. So if I, I solve a mission, they can be really happy, they can shoot fireworks over me or uh, something and sort of uh, be this sort of this uh, uh, entity that can embody some kind of feeling when I do something uh, good. 
When we take that to the next level, then we also can have sort of this, what I call the intelligent helper bot. And these are um, what's in the gaming world called non-player characters or NPCs, where um, that's a sort of entities that you can interact with. These uh, will look uh, in a way that are, shouldn't be able to, or you should be able to distinguish them from um, other avatars. So for instance, could be these, uh, for instance, in the middle here, these sort of faceless entities, or it can be that they only can have these skins that are don't like are, don't really are any clothing, but more sort of anonymous entities to show that these are not real avatars. And these can be then teacher assistants. Uh, they can help answer questions, uh, hand out assignments, and be social entities. And these are obviously controlled by some kind of combination of AI, machine learning, or some other buzzword that you want to use uh, right now uh, in that, uh, that context. We have done experiments in this area earlier, having sort of more sort of chat, um, chat entities um, in, in there. Um, Sorry for just looking to the side. I think it's uh, Victor. Can you move out of the camera view uh, there? Because I see you jumping around uh, on my second screen here. He, Victor is in, in walkabout doing stuff to annoy me. Uh, <laughs> uh, there. Anyhow, so so these entities can then are there to sort of help uh, the the students learn uh, more. Another thing that, uh, that we have um, a prototype on is uh, save, saving and playback and sort of kind of, sort of scripting so I can record my movement in a walkabout. So I move in a certain way, I jump, I uh, launch web screens, I open web pages, etc. And this is all done um, play, uh, recorded. And then in walkabout, I can play it back. Um, as either a copy of myself, so there will be sort of a virtual entity uh, of myself or a replacement of myself. So I can then sort of fake myself being live inside of a, um, uh, of a teaching uh, um, experience here. And, there. and this means that also the other participants can then interact with the recording. So I can then have several uh, avatars being replayed and other avatars then can move around and interact with them and sort of get the sort of mix of uh, pre-recorded and live um, animations uh, or interactions in there. Yes, um, so this can be then sort of some kind of sort of learning nugget. So I, I prepare like a two minute uh, explanation of something and, and during my lecture or session, I can just load then load in that into the uh, to the session. Animations, as I said, is quite key in this here uh, in this environment. We want to have many different uh, animations. So here um, uh, we have been experimenting with motion capture. So we have equipment for that. So in this picture, you here you see Agneta in a full body uh, motion capture suit. The headband she has on her head is actually uh, motion uh, sensitive. So when she moves her head, the avatar also move and we can record different, uh, um, different animations. So the images on the right there uh, are then uh, stills from uh, well, a sort of recording session where we record animations. And here is, here's a sort of an example of this animation glove that you see in the, in the picture um, that you, you put up. And this box here in the middle, that's then sort of a computer with Wi-Fi um, and, um, and motion capture uh, or ac accelerometers um, and rotation devices, uh, et cetera, or rotation detection devices um, in there. So, so that is something we wanna experiment more with. That also takes us to the next level, and that is live control. So today I can control my avatar using sort of a keyboard or an iPad, touch interface. I have some an, an, an animations. I can sort of predefine, oh, I want to wave one arm. I want to wave two arms. I want to jump, roll around, etc. But I can't really control it as I would when I'm speaking right now. And, and 
when we have sort of motion capture, we can also get this live in and control the, the various avatars. So here you in, in the picture on the left, you see a very strange device with this sort of plate on my chest that holds up an iPhone that looks on my, on my face and then records my face expressions. And, and as you can see, it detects if I stick out my tongue or I raise my hands or my thumb, etc. And then this com in a combination with a sort of full body capture suit would then make my avatar come alive in there. And uh, obviously not everybody would have this, but you could use this sort of for, for live bigger presentations or if you want to as a teacher uh, in, in the session. Talking about the worlds as well, um, we can then also, today we only have sort of these imagination worlds, but um, we want to also grab in sort of real live worlds in there, and that could be then architectural models. Uh, in this picture on the right here, this is a model of our university library. And um, at the bottom left is a real-time 3D scan of a point cloud. And this is actually of a uh, real mine here up in, in the north. So this is taken uh, with a, a self-controlled uh, flying drone. So a drone that, that then flies in the corridors and grabs all this uh, data uh, there. And um, the reason I mentioned these sort of point clouds where you sort of, you grab the environment in this way is that the, the building owners of all the government uh, buildings in Sweden, they are planning on 3D scanning all the buildings in, in, that they own in Sweden. So basically every university will be 3D scanned. And we wanna use that data for having sort of real world um, um, version uh, in, inside of Walkabout. And the interesting thing here is that it's quite easy for us to add these types of 3D data, 3D environments in the environment and sort of add, uh, make it possible for us to move around and, and walk around in them. So finally, some final words on sort of walk about usage or other, other usage. So obviously uh, learning, um, so far I've talked primarily about university learning uh, here, like student learning, um, and typically younger adults and some older adults, but we're also looking at using walkabout for children and especially for instance, this real-time translation thing that we have in Dialogica right now that we're moving over to, to walk about. Here we're going to um, work with immigrant children. So we have already a collaboration with the school here in Northern Sweden that have very many nationalities uh, in the school and where language is a big uh, barrier. So we want to use walkabout to show how to behave in a school, sort of what do you do in a classroom? What do you do outside? And how do you sort of interact? But also moving to adult learning, the lifelong learning. So how can we use this tool for that, that scenario? And then also other kinds of just using it for work, like social environments, using it for meetings, uh, connection 24 seven, that you, then you, you just hang out in this environment, a sort of a, a complement and this sort of hybrid work environment that we live in right now, with, where some people are at the physical workplace, some people are working from home or wherever they're working right now, but using a sort of virtual tool, they, you get a more better feeling of, of connectedness or other types of events, work with this for recruitment, information in general, have sort of these bots come in and answer uh, questions. Uh, make it fun. As I said initially, um, fun typically means higher engagement. And, and this being sort of coming from a sort of more computer gaming experience, we also want to have more fun parts in there, just to sort of in, give sort of the users, students, learners sort of in, inspirations. So you can have the kind of sort of loot boxes that are quite popular in, in, in games today, where you, you, if you do certain things, you get a, you get a, a box uh, and you then open it and you get rewards. But this can also be then physical or virtually physical boxes inside the 3D worlds. So you walk around, you find them, you open them, or you have to do some kind of task before you, you can open them. And in there you, you find various things like, for instance, fireworks as mentioned before, but also perhaps the ability to call a horse. So you then suddenly can ride on a horse in, in the world instead of just running around. 
have different kind of mini games, uh, paint guns, as in, in here, I'm not very fond of having sort of guns in, in this world, but you have to symbolize something that you hold in your hand, perhaps more a sort of Harry, Pos Harry Potter wizard um, stick or something, uh, wand, I mean, uh, where you sort of do things and you can paint the world or you can change the world uh, in a fun way. Stickers, uh, arcade games, and then different kind of portals um, in there to jump between different places inside, uh, inside the world, but sort of making it fun. And when it comes to sort of doing this in a computer development tool, and I'll come back to that in a moment, means also that there are tons of different graphical elements. There's different uh, things that we can quite easily add to the uh, environment. Other uh, things that we want to look at, sort of call it extensions, is more, more be able to show uh, emotions. So in this case here, we, um, we show, uh, uh, we show uh, like emotions through sort of our uh, sort of rather crude facial expressions. Uh, we can add uh, also add things on, on in front of our, our face here. Um, avatar customization, uh, so customize clothing, skin color attributes. Today we only have adults in there, but we want also uh, want to add kids, so children, uh, so you can then show, oh, oh, I'm a child, and then that's a teacher, perhaps it's an adult, so show the difference between being a child or an, an adult in this world. Have different weather scenarios, or perhaps change the time of day. So say the time of day would follow the length of the lecture. So if I have a 90-minute lecture, uh, it would then start with the sunrise, and when we're starting to reach sort of the end of the lecture, Lecture, the sun would start to set in this uh, world to signify that we are approaching the end of the session. And then finally, sort of uh, text to animation, we are machine learning. Uh, we already have this in sort of in prototypes where I can then type text and that would, that would then generate both text to speech, uh, but also change how the, the, the face changes based on um, what I'm sort of speaking right now to get a sort of facial expression out of that. AR, MR, VR, or XR is the common name here, sort of augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality. All of this is something that we, uh, that we already experiment. We've been experimenting with it for many years. And here we can take walk about into this quite, um, uh, quite easily. So sorry about that. So so here, um, for instance, we um, we have a uh, this is a um, a Vario XR three uh, sort of right now. So one of the world's best um, virtual and mixed reality headsets. Uh, out there with really high resolution and uh, how can we use that uh, in learning scenarios. And here in the picture, you'll also see Agneta with the Microsoft HoloLens, uh, and there it's the HoloLens 2, where, which is sort of a mixed reality uh, tool. So how can we use that uh, to enhance the learning situations, both for, uh, as a student, but as a teacher? So how can I get sort of an overlay in there so I still can sort of interact and control my avatar, uh, et cetera, but uh, then see the real world at the same time? So, approaching the end here. So, status. So, um, Walkabout is not uh, released yet. Uh, we have it sort of for internal testing in what we call pre-alpha. Um, the most uh, of the things for sort of user movements, we can be many um, avatars. We have voice chat, we have animations, we have web screens, uh, we can modify the web screens, etc. control slides, etc. in there. Uh, but that's right now it. Um, we have uh, also internationalization with real-time translation to different uh, um, different uh, um, languages is in there. Uh, but we want to um, add more features before we uh, release that. So uh, it's uh, today we have it on iOS, Mac, Windows. It probably works on Android on, and Linux as well, but we haven't really tested it yet. We have about 10 different worlds. Uh, we can support many users, voice chat, web screens. The UI is a bit half-baked. Um, we need to work more on the user interface icons. Um, 
and we want uh, we have sort of the real time translation there and we have a uh, about 30 different animations today and obviously want to add more later and there it's not that it's hard to add more animations but uh, just that all of this takes time to to do so a few words about the implementation uh, i already said several times that uh, talk about computer games and walkabout is actually built as a game uh, there it's built in a commercial um, game engine called unity uh, which is something that's used for building commercial games for real so it, it's like um, I think uh, many, many, many of the games that you play on your mobile devices or if you play on desktops are made in Unity. So basically two major uh, game development engines exist today. You have Unity and you have something called Unreal, and then there's a number of, of other engines as well, but there's just a smaller amount of games made with them. Uh, so Unity is a very powerful tool for handling uh, all, of, um, all of this. So the pros of using Unity, why we chose this, is that we very simply can get many different platforms. So if we, we wanted to publish Walkabout on a PlayStation, for instance, and we had access to the hardware for development, then we could do that. Um, we can just with a few clicks, then publish it for Windows, Mac, um, Linux, iOS, Android, and many other platforms uh, as well, because all of this you get for free inside the environment. We get a lot of animations, graphics, lights, scenes, etc. handling that, character controllers, uh, tons of assets. I already mentioned before that there's tons of information, uh, like tools we can use, there are graphical elements. Um, first time I mentioned sort of fireworks again, or portals and fire and everything. And all of this is sort of, it's just available. You, have, you either you have them for free or you can buy them very, very cheaply and then import them into the, the tool. Uh, we get networking for free or somewhat for free. Uh, Unity itself doesn't have a sort of good networking um, solution, but there are many other packages. Uh, once again, coming back to these assets being available. And it's also very easy to change to other types of realities like AR, MR, or VR in there. Uh, the cons include that if from a development perspective, it's not always that good. If you had, uh, do simultaneous editing, you have several developers doing, you have to be a bit careful on how you edit certain files. And, and the last one, which is really important, is that there's no sort of common user interface library. There's not sort of an easy way of saying, okay, this application should look like a Mac application on Mac, and it should look like a iOS application or an Android application, but rather you have to define what the buttons look like, what the menus look like, what the pop-up windows look like, and sort of try to get a, a good user interface story um, in there. So the future, I've talked quite a lot about sort of things that we don't have available um, today. Uh, but uh, moving forward, there's a lot of things that we want to want to add. For instance, importing 3D objects, uh, more UI work, uh, show different kind of beacons, have some kind of map feature that you can um, uh, see where everybody else is right now. Uh, that's quite obvious uh, obvious from testing that you quite easily lose track of your your fellows in there. They sort of they can be quite close, but they're behind some building or something, and you can't really see where they are. Uh, more dedicated uh, servers, so we can have more sort of persistence in there. Um, the text to speech is only available in Dialogica uh, on iOS today, so we want to make that available on Windows and, and Mac uh, as well. We want to work more on sort of the open natural worlds that adapt to the real world. Um, once again, I've done work in this earlier. So you have these sort of procedural generated worlds where you have uh, buildings, you have um, you have trees, uh, mountains, lakes, etc., all created dynamically. And the next time you join, you get a new world, or and you can get you can sort of adapt to the world while you are in it and change, for instance, from winter to summer and get snow, etc. And and here to to get this sort of uh, going. So to conclude, uh, before we do a quick demo, here is uh, some links to further. Um, um, 
further information. I have sort of a, sort of a, a, a forms uh, link here. I'll share this later in, in the chat where you can fill out if you want to get notified about future changes and, and sort of invites to future sessions, more information. At the bottom, you have a link to a publication around it. It was also included in the invitation to this presentation um, today. So now let me just quickly check on the, the chat to see. Um, okay, somebody, thank you, Lennart. Somebody left us um, there, but there's no uh, other questions. So I'll just jump into a, a demo in, instead. So I'm going to start off with a, um, a Dialogica um, demo. Uh, just hang on, I just lost my, my uh, links. I'm going to find that again. Um, I see Agneta is dancing in Walkabout, but I'm going to jump, just quickly show you Dialogica before we walk, jump into um, to, um, Walkabout. So here I'm going to optimize for video clip, no audio right now. So here you have uh, Dialogica. This is what you see when you join um, Dialogica for the first time, we have some settings, we can change name. Here you have the language. I can have, now in this case here, language is what is spoken. So in this case here is Hindi, um, but I can then have many different uh, languages that I want to have, perhaps have it in Danish here. I can change the UI language to here to Swedish. It changes immediately, or I want to have Dutch or I, let's see if we have um, uh, French here. Uh, I, I can't uh, vouch for the, the, the different words here. These are real-time translated. I don't speak French. Um, so I perhaps get some feedback later on here if these are actually uh, valid or, or, or not. So, but let me just quickly switch back to English here. So here and in this, I can then create a room. Oh, right, up in the uh, right, upper right corner, we have then different kinds of profiles. I didn't really mention that, but this is more sort of the, sort of the permissions in the room. So I can have a teacher that have all the permissions while the students that join, they can't, for instance, use voice chat. They cannot use uh, other tools in here as well. So let me just then create a room. Here, um, so this is here Magnus, he's a skeleton. Here we have various buttons for animations uh, in here, and we can then do sort of the, just to show you the the um, uh, the conversation tree. Let me see if I have something saved here. No, I didn't. Um, just so so here I can uh, create different connections uh, in my trees uh, in this um, here. Uh, so I can create new uh, nodes, et cetera. Though. But that wasn't the, sort of the main purpose of this, but I just wanted to show you this here, um, uh, what Dialogica is. So now I'm going to quit Dialogica and then move over to Walkabout instead. So here I'm going now to share Walkabout instead. And here we have some, somebody standing very close to the camera. And there we go. Let me see, I'll just move that. Um, Move that window a bit. So I hope. No, hang on. I just have to restart my sharing. Stu, Zoom doesn't like when you move things around too much. Here we go. So so here we have that's me in the middle. Um, so this is the world. I say hi, Agneta. Can you wave to me? There we have Agneta. She's waving to me. Well, who else do we have in here? We have Ilva, and then we have Victor. Uh, in here. So, so in this case here, so Victor is sitting down and he's typing on a, on a keyboard. Uh, Ilva, she's uh, rooting and saying, hey, come on guys, let's start this meeting. And Agneta is doing something else in here. So, so just to show you, um, here is the overview of the participants. As I said, uh, I mentioned before, I can move people around. I can then choose different types of avatars. As we see, we have tons of different avatars. Let me just scroll this. This probably looks really bad in Zoom, but there's a lot of avatars that we can choose from. And I'll just uh, switch to this alien looking uh, guy here in a spacesuit as we are in a, in a space world. Um, 
In this world, I can then run around, obviously. I can speed away. I can run up here and then I can, uh, I can jump. I can do a sort of what I call a super jump way up here. And here you get a sort of a better view of this sort of scavenger uh, world. And then we can look down on the other participants. Whoa, they fly around here um, in the world. So say, for instance, I want to move to and have my lecture, say, over here on this nice looking road with these strange things. And so I can just fetch everybody here. So then I just force all the different participants to me then, so they, they come to me. Uh, here I also can uh, change uh, worlds. So I have many different uh, worlds to choose from. So let's just change environment a bit. This is the, um, uh, the uh, pirate world. So here you, we have some, some pirate cannons, we have ships. And uh, obviously uh, in the future, we want to make this sort of come alive more. We have the water move, perhaps the ships move around. And all of that is something that's sort of quite easy to do when doing this as, as a computer game uh, environment. And just to quickly show some other environments, um, here we have the Japanese environments. This I know is Victor's uh, favorite environment. Uh, in here, um, we have these huge uh, old uh, Japanese castles, and we have this sort of this nice village and the pagodas, etc. And we have uh, Mount Fiji in the distance over there. So here I just do a quick super jump over to my favorite place in in this world, and this is this sort of nice um, nice Japanese uh, garden. So I'll just go here just to show you a bit sort of what it look like. And this is to show you the, that you can then have your sort of, you can have different environments uh, for, uh, for teaching uh, uh, where you have sort of your lectures, etc. Just quickly going through the different worlds. So this is the sci-fi world. This is the wild west world. Here we have a small church. We have a train, we can land on the roof here. Uh, here, obviously, we want to have some horses, etc. The train should move, there should be some smoke in, in there. We have the fantasy kingdom uh, world here, where we have like a castle, um, etc. A small church. We have this a bit sort of what we call the, the dev uh, world, which is just a sort of a whimsical world of just random things that are just put randomly uh, together. A nice little chest that perhaps it could be open up. If I, if I stand on this plate, for instance, then this would open and shoot up fireworks or something. This is a empty world where we just can run out of the city, small, small city park, city park, and just have it openly in a sort of empty world. This is the space, space explorer world. This is one of my favorites. I really li like the atmosphere in here. And as uh, this is the universe project, um, and then uh, we have to have, have more space stuff in there, right? So here the doors should be open, but just for the demo today, I disabled the colliders on this door. So, so if I walk inside, I can then walk through those two doors to, just to get inside this, in, in this environment here. So this is my space environment. Let's see if I can see anybody through the window. No, they are, they're all lost. I think they don't know. No, oh, but there's somebody missing, um, walking. So Agneta, if you go walk to your right and up the ramp, then you can follow me inside this building. Let me just quickly run back here to fetch Agneta. She can join me inside in the winter garden. Here, Agneta. Oh, come see, come see. <laughs> follow me, please. <laughs> you look drunk. <laughs> Agneta has trouble. Uh, Agneta is not so used to these sort of 3D world environments. So just follow me inside here. So here I just walk around um, and I just wanted to show you the winter garden, this space-like winter garden. So now we are on the, on the red planet on Mars here. And here we found obviously some strange alien artifacts. And we have these strange uh, flowers. And oh, I think we lost, no, there Agneta is coming. And no, Victor, it's oh. Silva, it's Silva. It, Oh, it's Ilva. Oh, sorry. I, I keep saying Agneta, but it's actually Ilva. Hi, Ilva. Um, so, so here we have our, our small uh, winter garden in here. And I think this is sort of a nice environment to have, say, a, a web screen. 
So I'll just a, um, create a one here, say for univer uh, universe, universe. How do you pronounce that, Agneta? I realized that I've never said it in English. <laughs> universe. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, universe. Yeah, I say universe. Some French people yeah. say universe, universe, universe. So, but I would say universe. Yeah. And, and some <laughs> universe. Yeah, okay. some say universe. So it's oh, but that's more of... Swedish. So yeah. anyhow, so now I created a web screen in here. I, I launched my uh, my web controls uh, here, so I can move this around. So where I want to place it. Said, are we going to have like a mini lecture up here that looks a bit small? So I just uh, let me just uh, enlarge the window a bit. I just move that up, sort of a bit to the left, perhaps then uh, turn it uh, turn it a bit, and I'll just zoom in a bit. Um, it's it's uh, we have this nice. Uh, acceptance of cookies down there that uh, I can't really um, access right now. And this that will come later on. Um, but um, that's not, uh, so that's, we can talk about universe. But uh, if I instead then open a, uh, say a presentation uh, instead in, in here. So let me just do that. I'll just cut and paste a very long URL, open web page and whoop. Here we, we instead have the uh, presentation of today. So in there. So here I can then um, just show the slides just as I did in my real animation. Our real uh, presentation can go back and forth. Uh, and in that particular presentation, we are then at, at that slide. So, so with that, I think I can conclude my actual demo. And I think I'll just stop the recording there. And no, no, and I've got a screen sharing paused. And let's see, stop recording. Thank you. No.